Well, hey, I want to start by saying hello to our Takatnu campus. It's great to be with you today. Raspberry, give our Takatnu clan a round of applause. I wish I could be with you in person today, but I can't. But it's great to be with you virtually. And I listen, Takatnu, I want you guys to know, I think about you and pray for you all the time. Justin and Lee and the team, they, they give such great reports and uh, just fun to pray with you. I look forward to being with you in person as soon as possible. You know, and for those of you online, uh, it's great to get reports every week about the things that God's doing all over the place, all, all over the world, literally, through our online ministry. It's great to be with you today, and I pray for, for you as well. Well, hey, for the last several weeks, we've been in the Old Testament. That's the bigger part of the Bible, right? The big part. And we've been taking a look at some ancient people, stories of ancient people, but really for the purpose of getting fresh glimpses of God, because God never changes, right? He's the same today as he was then. And we are going to these stories, we're asking two questions. We're asking the question, what can I learn about myself from this story? Because although some things have changed, people are still people, and we can learn things about ourselves, and then most importantly, the second question, what can I learn about the God who never changes. Well, today we're going to be in the Old Testament again, kind of way back towards the beginning, and we're going to be in the story of a man named Bezalel. And Bezalel shows up in the book of Exodus, which is the second book of the Bible, and it's in Exodus chapter 31. And here's what's going on. Moses, in Exodus 31, he's up on a mountain. Moses is the leader of the people of Israel, uh, God about uh, that, at this point, it's about four months earlier, had uh, led them out of their slavery there in Egypt, across the Red Sea, through the wilderness, and now they're at Mount Sinai, and God's called Moses up on the mountain alone, most of the time alone, with him, so that God can tell Moses a whole bunch. God's got a lot to say. In fact, Moses is on that mountain for 40 days. Right? I go doll sheep hunting for seven to ten days, and that's a long time. You're like, man, I don't even get back in a car. Whoa, this is moving really fast. He was on the mountain 40 days. And, uh, and God's got a lot to say. God's, God's giving Moses the law, gives him the Ten Commandments, but then gives them all of these other uh, laws and rules and guidelines for how his people could live and could flourish. And then God starts to give Moses instructions for building the, what's called the tabernacle. And this was a huge deal. Because, you see, the presence of God on earth was lost in Eden. When Adam and Eve rebelled and, and drove a wedge between them and God, that, the God's presence on earth was lost in Eden and had not been back. And God now has created his people and is going to reestablish his presence among his people. This is a huge deal, and he's going to do it through the tabernacle, this kind of movable and portable temple, if you will. And God gives very explicit, detailed, and lengthy instructions for how to manufacture the tabernacle. You can go to Exodus and read it there, some also in some of the other books, just on and on, page after page of Use this wood, make these sort of curtains, make these tables, make this altar uh, out of this and out of that. And I, I don't know what a, a Moses was thinking here. Right? As I know when I start to map out a construction project, it can get a little overwhelming, especially if I get into areas I don't know a lot about, like, oh my gosh, this one's got a bunch of plumbing, right? And he, I, I don't, there's no sign that Moses had any construction experience. He was a prince. He was raised as a prince. You know, typically the, you know, the one percenters don't do a lot of their own construction. So, so there's no sign. I mean, he's up on the mountain and God's laying out all this. And it, it goes into garment making and how to make clothes. And, and I, I could just imagine Moses thinking, oh, my goodness. How am I going to remember this? And more importantly, how in the world is this actually going to get done? And then we get to what God says and I think Moses was relieved by what God says in Exodus 31, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, 
I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ashimach, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that's on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the tables and its utensils, and the pure lampstand with all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons for their service as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant, in, and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all that I've commanded you, they shall do. I imagine Moses was relieved that God was passing this assignment on to Bezalel and his team. Now, this is all we get about Bezalel's story. It's not much. A little bit later, Moses will assemble all the people and tell them what God said and, and will kind of publicly appoint Bezalel and Aholiab. And, and, and then we learn that you know, that they've finished the work. But that's all we get. God's the only one who tells us really anything about Bezalel. But there's a lot we can learn from this. You know, one of the things that I like about Bezalel is I think we can, we can see, all of us can see ourselves in his story, right? Maybe not, we can't do everything like he can, but I mean, what would Bezalel, what vocation would he choose if he were alive today? Well, that's an interesting question, right? Maybe he'd be, you know, a, a, just a tradesman, he, you know, an electrician, right? Because I tell you what, there, well, there's some artistry in some of a, a good electrician's work, right? Maybe he'd be a plumber, but maybe he'd be more of a, uh, maybe he'd be a, a web page designer, right? Because he's kind of a jack of all trades guy who obviously loves to produce things, create things. And whether we have little skill or lots of skill at any particular, we can kind of see ourselves like, oh, you know, some of you like to sew, not me. Uh, but I do enjoy kind of framing stuff. And I think he was a framer. Uh, but he was also somebody who enjoyed creating garments. He was an artist, an artisan, a tradesman. He's, there's a little bit of all of us in Bezalel's story. We can see ourselves there. And there's lots that we can learn. I've got six lessons from Bezalel's story that I pulled out that apply to my life and I believe apply to yours as well. I want to show you today. Here's the first lesson that I take away from Bezalel's story. His story reminds us that God has important purposes for all of our lives. Don't miss the significance of, of something here. God says, see, I have called Bezalel by name. That's huge. Because up to this point in time, the only people that the Israelites knew that had been called by name were Moses and his brother Aaron. They were called by name by God. And that makes sense probably to the people of Israel. After all, Moses was the adopted son of Pharaoh. He'd been raised as a prince of Egypt, right? So it kind of makes sense that, that he would be a, called by name and appointed to lead the people of Israel. And his brother, Aaron, kind of makes sense there too. Aaron was uh, learned and, and a great spokesperson. It would make sense that God would give Moses, call him by name and give Moses the purpose of leadership and that he'd call Aaron by name and give Aaron the purpose of being the spokesperson and, the, and ultimately the high priest and, and, and religious leader. Those made sense, but Bezalel? Really? 
And it goes, God calls a second person by name here, Oholiab. I mean, if it was a shocker that, that Bezalel would get called by name by God, it was a double, triple shocker that God would then call Oholiab. Like, whoa, what does this say about God? And what does this say about us? God has a, has a special purpose for each and every one of us. And as followers of Christ who have all of the scripture, we have had Jesus come, the living word. We know that for every one of us who's in Christ, God has called us by name. He's called us. Jesus tells us this, right? Jesus, Jesus tells us in John 10 that we're his sheep. And he says, I call my sheep by name. If you're in Christ, God's called you by name. He has an important purpose for your life. And I know this can be hard to believe at times, right? Because there are a lot of people, billions of people, and we can feel awfully small, right, and insignificant and redundant amongst you know, one person amongst billions. How can God have some important purpose for me? But God does. The scripture tells us this. God's called you by name. And God never, God never wastes one of his called out ones. That's what being a, a member of a church, a Christian means, called out one. God never wastes one of his called out ones on anything less than a glorious purpose. God has an important purpose for each of our lives. More than one. In most cases. Well, here's a second thing I take away from Bezalel's story. Bezalel's story reminds me that, that God fills every Christian with his spirit. And now this is something that I think I take way too, way, way too much for granted. The, 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 the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The people of Israel did not take this for granted. I mean, it was a stunner for God to first call Bezalel out by name, but then to say, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. It, being filled with the Spirit of God was almost unheard of at this time. In fact, before Moses himself, the only person, the only hint we find in Scripture before Moses of, of a person being filled with the Spirit of God is the story of Joseph, and it's kind of hinted at. Pharaoh says that about Joseph. He has the Spirit of God. That's the only hint we get. And that was 400 years earlier before God fills Moses. So when the Israelites hear God's called Bezalel by name and God's filled Bezalel with his Spirit, mind blown. Mind blown crazy. But here's what's really crazy. For the last 2,000 years, every follower of Jesus has been filled for a lifetime with the Spirit of God. That's mind blown. That's crazy. And I take it way too much for granted. Every one of us who know Christ, we're called by name, and we're filled with the Spirit of of God. I know I don't act like it most of the time, much of the time. But thank God that the Spirit is in me. And, and, and the Bible says, because I have the Spirit of God, I possess everything I need for life and for godliness. To the degree to which I fail to live up to that, it's on me. Because the pathway and the power from God is there within me. God has important purpose for us purposes for our lives, that he's given us everything we need to accomplish his purposes. We're indwelt by the Spirit of God in him. Third lesson from Bezalel's story. God has given every follower of Christ specific gifts and abilities that he intends to use to accomplish the purposes that he's set for us. God gave 
skills and abilities to Bezalel, right, to Aholiab. But he didn't stop there. I hope you didn't miss the fact that he then goes on and says, says, I have given to all able men ability. It wasn't just Bezalel and Aholiab. All able men, God says, I've given ability. Scott, I don't have any special abilities that I'm aware of. I'm not some, you know, incredibly talented master craftsman. I'm just an accountant. I'm just in retail. I'm just a waiter. I'm just a stay-at-home mom. I'm just, and on and on the list goes, right? Because we often don't think or feel like we have any special talents. But yes, you do. Because every talent you have is a gift from God. And that makes those talents, those abilities, special. Every one of us has been given by God a unique set of abilities and insights and talents and gifts and experiences. Not accidents. They're specifically designed by God for you and for the purposes he's got for your life. Check out what the what, what God says through the Apostle Paul in uh, the first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12. Paul writes, Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. God has given unique abilities to all of us, and he empowers them in all of us. See, what makes your abilities and your talents and your gifts special isn't the level of ability that you possess or how rare those abilities are. What makes your abilities special is the fact that you're special. You're uniquely designed by God. You're called by name and that God has empowered your abilities. That's what makes them special. It's all about him. Fourth lesson. I love this one. Bezalel's story reminds us that God, God teams us up with others to accomplish his purposes. God's a believer in team. God teamed Moses up with Aaron, and here he teams Bezalel up with Aholiab. See, God created us to need each other. That's how, we're, that's how we're created. What did God say after creating Adam, if you know that creation story? God creates Adam, looks down at Adam and says, and there's three people in the Godhead, they say to each other, yeah, it is not good for man to be alone. Ladies, on behalf of all men, you might, this may be the only time you hear this. We need you, ladies. We need you. Some of the times we remember that. And here's the truth. You need us. We need each other. And in the context of marriage, that can be forgotten too easily. One of the lies that Satan uses to erode marriages is the lie that Husbands and wives don't need each other. They're just together for each other's happiness. Every time I talk to a, a couple who, whose marriage is struggling, I, I find out to some level or another they're, they're hearing that lie. They're thinking that life, life would actually be better separated. I'm, I'm a... About to be, Ruth and I are about to be empty nesters. Our youngest heads off to college here in a few weeks. And I tell you, I think as I look around at kind of peers of mine, similar stage in life, I think that the lie that husband and wives don't need each other is particularly powerful at this stage that I, Ruth and I are now in, empty nesting. Because the, the presence of kids in the house kind of reminds us, yeah, maybe I do need you around. There's a lot of food to be cooked, right? Or there's a lot of, you know, 
discipline to be done or whatever it might be. Kids kind of remind parents if they're around and they're in the house and we're raising them that we need each other. But when kids leave, the lie that ah, maybe we don't, maybe we'd actually be better off alone. That lie gets particularly powerful. But it's such a lie, right? Because husband and wives need each other in a special way to navigate that change of seasons and all that goes on in those midlife years. And, and the kids that are out of the house need both parents to be investing in them and parenting them through that massive change in their life stage. And then marriage comes and grandkids, husbands and wives never stop needing each other. This is why Jesus tells us what God put together in a marriage Man should not tear apart. We need each other. That's why he teams us up. He teams us up in biological families. He teams us up in spiritual families. We believe in team here at Change Point, And we put it in practice every place that we can. God teams people up. He's a believer in teams. And if you're feeling as if you're going through life alone, that's not God's plan for you. Let him team you up in your biological family, but also perhaps that's not where he's going to primarily team you up. Maybe it's in your spiritual family. Maybe it's right here at Change Point. In fact, I know if this is your church home, God intends to use your spiritual family as some of the teammates he wants to bring alongside you. We're going to be talking about that quite a bit in the coming weeks, teaming up. Well, here's a fifth principle from Bezalel's story. It reminds me that all of life is ministry. There's no part of life that's not ministry. And this is very counter-normal for us American Christians. I think it was counter-normal for Bezalel. I mean, Bezalel grew up in Egypt as a slave. He had not likely heard much about this God called Yahweh, that 400 years earlier his ancestors had supposedly heard from. He grew up in Egypt as a slave. and the, It would never have occurred to Bezalel, I don't think, that Yahweh would have use for his abilities. That Yahweh would have had a divine purpose on his life. That, just, that, that would not, I don't think, have occurred to Bezalel. To the degree to which Bezalel even had the concept of someone serving God with skills and abilities, he certainly would not likely have imagined it would be him. And unfortunately, way too many of us as Christians have the same perspective on our abilities. We can't imagine how God would ever use us to do ministry. Because ministry is something that people with other Spiritual skills, right, have. Ministry is something Scott does from the stage. It's interesting if you study the Greek word ministry, it's pretty easy to figure out what it means. Ministry in the Greek is a word that means to serve. That's all it means. It's not spiritualized in the Greek. It just means to serve. But when you think about life... Isn't that a good definition of all of work, right? Work is service. In fact, economists, that's how they define work. Work is the exchange of goods and services. Work, according to economists, is service, is serving. Work is ministry. Now, of course, the Bible adds a dimension to work, to ministry, that that, that the Greek, secular Greeks didn't, and that we don't today outside of, of the scriptures, it adds the dimension of work, of serving others for a transcendent purpose, for the purpose of glorifying Christ. Colossians 3.23 makes this clear. Whatever you do, just think about that, whatever you do, if we're only in church a little bit of, you know, an hour and a half a week, Whatever we do, 
Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You see, ministry is work. Work is ministry as long as our motivation is where it should be. See, for a Christian with the right motivation, all of life is ministry. Whatever you do, work heartily as to the Lord. It would have blown Bezalel's mind when, when he realized that the very abilities that he'd been making a living with were now being put to use by God for his glory. Mind blown for Bezalel. But some of us, we need our minds blown by that same, not just possibility, but longing from God that we would discover what Bezalel did, that God is divinely gifted and empowered each and every one of us who he's called by name, given us purpose, and intends for us to, to be in ministry in all of the endeavors of our life as we serve. But that's a mindset thing, because so many of us are working not to serve. We're working for the weekend, Right? <laughs> everybody's working. Yeah, it's a, it's a mind change. It's what the gospel, Bible says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We see life differently because we can see God in it. The scriptures are the only way that happens. And then we have to remind ourselves, right? That's what Christian community is about, helping us remember, recall, and step into all that God has for us. Mind blown. Well, final lesson I want to highlight from Bezalel's story. It also has to do with ministry, but specifically the ministry that we do in the context of our church family. The ministry that we extend, the service that we extend to one another as part of a local church. You see, God wants all of our work to be ministry. But part of that is the ministry he wants us to extend to one another as members of a church family. You know, it's just like it's difficult for many of us to think of, of the rest of our lives outside of the hour and a half we spend on Sundays as ministry. It's equally as hard for some of you to think about how God could use you in the context of ministry in your church. For some of you, the idea that God would use you to minister to others inside of a church, that's a crazy idea to you. But you know, the Bible, the New Testament talks about this a lot. I just want to highlight one example. Romans 12. Paul writes this. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Get this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us. And what's he then say? Let us use them. And here he's talking about in the context of, of church family, of Christian community. We got different gifts, Paul says. Let us use them. Give some examples. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Paul here is just giving examples of the different gifts and abilities that God wants to use. We all need, Paul goes on and on with this metaphor of the body and how we, one member can't say to another, I don't need you. We all need each other. Let us use them, Paul says. God wants to use you to serve others here. If this is your church home, right here at Change Point Raspberry. How does God want you to use you to minister to your fellow Change Point church family members? I don't know, but God does. I know he has a plan. This fall, we're going to be talking a lot about engagement here at Change Point, being engaged and connected and active and involved in our church family. 
engaged in community, engaged with serving each other. Because the truth is, we've all felt how much COVID has disengaged us. This fall, we're going to talk a lot about engagement. Because disengagement from our church family is not God's plan. Right? It's not. Engagement and involvement with, his, with your family is. Because God intends to use how he's uniquely created you. The unique purposes he's put on your life. He intends to use you in lots of different ways, including serving those who are part of your church family. We need each other. We need you. You know, I'll just give an example. We, we earlier in this service, we spiked opportunities in our student ministry. We need each other to be investing in the next generation. Right, families, healthy families, everybody's got a role in investing in the next generation, right? Parents do, but so do the grandparents. So do aunts and uncles. So do older siblings and cousins. Healthy families, everyone partners together to invest in the next generation. It's no different here as a church family as we come together to invest spiritually in our next generation. There's a role for every one of us in that family priority, that family area of serving each other. We need each other. We need each other when we gather. Right? Sundays we all gather together. And I love the way I watch us serve each other. Doors get opened. Chairs are set up. Ushers take care of us. Security team is keeping us safe. There's so many ways we serve each other on Sunday. And yet, I'm telling you right now, there is room on every, we have lots of Sunday service teams, from the greeters to the ushers to the parking to the prayer team, the welcome center, the, the folks behind the cameras and the screens, the musicians, on and on it goes. We've got all these Sunday teams, but I'm telling you, every single one of those Sunday teams has lots of room for others to step in alongside them. And I'm hoping that as, as our family gets more and more and more engaged, some of you are going to come up with ways that you want to use your gifts that you don't see a team that fits you perfectly well. Like, you know, I think I'd like to start doing something new. I, in fact, I was thinking this week as I was pulling in here at Raspberry, our landscaping, our landscaping here at Raspberry Campus, it could, it could use a little love. I'm not the guy to do that. I'm a framer, right? I'll go frame something up. But some of you, that's something you're passionate about. We don't have a landscaping team. Maybe some of you should start one because we got some Charlie Brown Christmas trees out there from what I can tell. COVID has not been kind to our, to our greenery, our shrubbery. The point is my point. Bezalel's story reminds me that God's called all of us to be engaged, serving each other in the context of our church family. We need each other, and God wants to use all of us. Well, I'm going to turn it over, Justin, to you at Takatnu for the pastor's challenge. And here at Raspberry, let me give you what I took out to challenge myself this week. And I found my pastor's challenge Actually, in, uh, at the, the last place you see Bezalel mentioned, it's over a little bit farther to the right in Exodus in chapter 36. We read this, Exodus 36, verse 2. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every, crafts, every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill. Everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. So here's my challenge to myself and to all of us. Let's let God stir up our hearts for ministry. Because God's got to do that. I'm way too lazy. I don't know about you. I'm way too self-absorbed. I don't want to serve anybody. <laughs> Right? I, don't wanna, I just want to work for the weekend. But I've got the Spirit of God, and if you know Christ, so do you. 
who gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And the Spirit of God in you and in me wants to stir up our hearts and give us vision for the ministry, for the purposes he's called us. And give us, give us a totally different mindset on, on what to do with all the hours of our week and with the abilities that he's given us because he makes them special. Let God, let's, let's let God stir up our hearts for ministry. Ministry inside the church, yes, for sure. Like, yeah, ministry inside the church, but ministry way beyond that. We spend a lot more hours apart from each other than we do together. Ministry had better extend far beyond the walls and the programs of our church family. You with me? Hey, pray with me if you would. Father, thank you so much for your word and for this fresh reminder from a, 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 a story that only covers a few verses and yet is so full of you and your heart for us, your love for us, your desire to be in relationship with us and your desire to give us hope and a purpose. God, would you freshly inspire all of us with your vision for our lives, and with that inspiration, stir up our hearts to be used by you to show your love and your power and your glory to a world that so needs to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.